Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This being a show where I talk about TV shows of the supernatural, fantasy, and or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of The Magicians, as well as the latest episode of The 100. Like always, if I'm talking about something that you don't want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include a time when I talk about each of the respective shows I'm talking about. So, for example, if you want to hear what I have to say about this week's episode of The Magicians, you can skip to what I had to say, skip to what I had to say about this week's episode of The 100. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the magicians. So in this episode, we finally got a real look at the curse that Martin put on, uh, like, you know, dealing with the whole king, king and queens type of situation. And it turns out the curse is basically a curse to basically make everyone go crazy. In particular, it's the thrones that they sit on that are cursed. Essentially made everyone turn against each other. Margot, Quentin, Alice, and Elliot all kind of wanting to kill each other. And, um, because, like, apparently it's been a thing that's come up in the past. Obviously, when they originally came there, went into their, um, uh, into that throne room last episode, obviously saw all the dead bodies and stuff like that. I love the fact this, that the people of the kingdom didn't even really think about it. They were like, well, a lot of these people just killed each other. We just assumed it was just kind of a power struggle thing. We didn't really think there was more of a magical element to it. But it's like, yep, all of them are trying to kill each other. Only person not affected is Penny. So I guess it, he kind of lucked out by the fact this, that he wasn't kind of chosen to be you know, a king, a fillery, like, well, like, Quentin, or, you know, like, Margot and Alice became queens, like, good, good thing he didn't become royalty, because he was the only one that kind of was able to keep his head clear throughout this whole situation, um, but it's so, it was so interesting seeing the fact that it's just, because it basically made them paranoid, even to the point that Margot and Quentin were about to fight, and basically, uh, I forgot, um, is it Kiko? demon the basically thing that got sealed on her back last episode uh margo used hers to try and kill quentin penny got in the way and used his so it's like those are done because both of them are kind of one shot things so like once you use them it can't be used again it's supposed to be kind of a last minute tactic like you know if you're kind of in the corner use it that's kind of what the point is supposed to be um, I do love the fact is that it's so interesting that it was up to Penny to have to say today. That's so interesting because Penny's the most kind of like fuck this noise type of situation. Like it's more trouble than this world. I mean, obviously he knows he needs them. He can't let them. I mean, if, it really, if he, if he could, you know, he really wouldn't bother with this situation, but he needs them because they're the only key to helping him, you know, get rid of the beast situation. I mean, cause let's not forget the beast would still want to get rid of Penny too, because Penny being a traveler and everything, the whole point is to kind of get rid of all roads to Fillory so that he'd be the only one that can go to and from Fillory like he wants to. So, you know, it hasn't come up so far, but that was kind of the whole thing in season one was like, he was, getting in contact with all travelers and, you know, uh, some of the travelers in particular ended up killing themselves. Hence why, like, you know, in this season, we, in, you know, when we found out about Victoria that she's off somewhere else, it's mainly because of that said situation. But it's kind of interesting. Like, he has to be the hero in this case. I love his plan. Basically, it's like the curse of acts in the sense of like, oh, it doesn't stop until everyone's dead. And to him, it's like, well, if everyone's dead, then the curse stops. And basically, the plan is to stop everyone's hearts and then restart them again because it's like technically they're dead that way the curse disappears. Granted, things didn't work out for him because his hands started going numb. I think the way he was saying was because the spell on his hands was still kind of new and it just, I don't know, I guess that was part of its means of trying to control his hands and stop them from well, controlling him. But, um, luckily, I mean, things kind of got out of him when Margo picked up one of the syring not, um, syringes and stabbed Quentin in the neck. And then she went and proceeded to go around and stab everyone else. And then proceeded to stab herself because it's like that. And in Penny's words, being like, yep, that curse is super effective. It's like, yep, she was the last one standing, so I had to make sure she ended up, you know, attempting to kill herself. But luckily, everyone was revived. But like I said... It put them in a very um, a compromised position because it's like, oh yeah, now there are two Keiko demons down, you know, both Penny's and Margot's. And it's like, actually th three because apparently at some point Alice ended up using hers. I forgot what the circumstances were, but... So the only one they have left now is Quentin. And now they're thinking about this whole plan on trying to capture the um, beast. And they're just kind of like... Basically, Quentin's basically the idea is to use it like a very low level spell, but it's like it's a very basic spell, but it kind of acts as kind of a barrier that it can kind of trap the beast in. But it's like, you know, I love the fact that Quentin uses some kind of weird analogy that basically, like, even though it's a low level spell, the fact of the matter is combined together. It's like, yo, it's like, you know, stroking one dick is good, but then you 
huge, you know? It's like stroking three dicks. And Margot's like, was it supposed to mean it's more pleasurable or powerful or something? And she's like, your analogy sucks. And he's like, well, the fact of the matter is it distracted you long enough for, for the fact is that, um, Mar you know, Alice would have time to do what she needs to. So it kind of proves the point. It, um, also, kind of since I'm thinking about Elliot, because he was the one like, oh, I see what you did there. I love the fact is that when Penny originally came with the needles and immediately Elliot's when I went, oh, heroin. I just always knew my life was going to end this way. It's just like, it's, I, I love that about Elliot. Like he had, he's almost a dark comic relief of the group, in my opinion. I mean, really all the characters kind of have a very comic relief aspect to them, but you know, it's like they have to hurry up because they're running out of time. And, you know, because sooner or later, all that God juice when they once again, still can't help, but, can't help the kind of pause every time I say that inside of Alice is running thin. So, but to kind of before I go further with that, kind of focus on the other side of the episode that dealt with the whole Morena situation. Once, once again, it still catches me off guard because I keep forgetting. No one knows about Fillory except for obviously the main characters. Obviously, Julia and the Dean, they're the only ones who really know about it. Because that whole thing about last episode when it came back, everyone asking about it. Like, Julia's like, oh, yeah, he, uh, the, the dude that's with me, uh, he came from Fillory. And she's like, oh, yeah, sure, if you're not going to tell me where he's really from and everything. Which, side note, too, this is the first episode I've actually noticed the fact is that he has 12 fingers. Did not notice that till now. I don't know why I, I didn't notice that. I just never did. It's t sucky on my part. Maybe they referenced it before, but I never really noticed it until this episode until they kind of pointed it out. Maybe it was always there, and I just, I don't know. But nevertheless, um, it gets even more twisted in uh, circumstances. Like, it's kind of, I mean, the whole situation is extremely sad with the whole Morena situation. Obviously, yeah, I'm, I, I try to keep everything in order, but I'm like, ah, screw that. Just, I don't know. Full on, like, Morena was obviously bait, but you don't, you didn't know to what extent she was bait. Martin ends up teleporting him and Julia out of there, because apparently that was kind of the plan the whole time, because it's like, she can't even be nearby when Morena's performing a spell, because that means he's going to get a whiff of everything and kind of know that Julia was around, and then... The point is kind of rush back there anyway, but the real plan was for her to summon him and that basically she go back to her place and Raynard would, you know, follow her there. That was kind of the plan to just, I guess, to get him in a uh, place because, you know, being the way he is, Martin is very smart in this type of situation because he knew things would kind of play out a certain way. So he knew Raynard would follow her back to a place, probably knew that she put up some kind of ward, which when he was talking about all oh, the fact is, you know, her wards are pretty good and everything. He's like, I was going to take some time. Part of me was wondering, like, is he taking his sweet time on purpose or not? Maybe. I just feel like, I don't know. Um, but it was really twisted. The fact is, though, he ended up tearing her cat inside, turning her cat, her familiar cupcake inside out and putting it on her lap biting off one of her fingers, was about to go for one of her toes until, like, luckily, they got there in time. And it's like, okay, he's frozen. Julia, take care of him. But then everyone's enacting their plan, and it's like, nope. At this very moment, like, she's about to get her revenge. The team strikes and takes, you know, teleports away. Well, Penny grabs Martin, but at the same time, Julia gets involved. They basically activate the barrier to stop him. And, you know, Alice is getting ready for the attack. But Quentin's worried about Julia being caught up in it, so he grabs her and pushes her out the way. But that wink is like the the barrier that's meant to hold him, and he kind of slips away. But Alice gets his shot off, only mortally wounding him. It messes up his arm, so now he's down down to one hand for magic. But he gets away before it can strike again. Then, then Julia, like it's kind of a, like I say, it's a sad moment all around for different things, like. On one side with the whole Julia situation, you feel bad for her because it's like, this is her moment for revenge, and it all goes up in flames because, one, she no longer has the beast to help her with the Renard situation. Morena, who was there to help her with this whole situation, is dead. So her need for revenge now has left her kind of alone because now that she's done everything that she's done, because of what she did, things fell apart, um... Martin kind of got away, so he kind of, you know, and they're not going to forgive her for the fact that she betrayed them. Yes, she has her reasons, but her need for revenge kind of took precedence over the fact is that the beast needed to be dealt with. I mean, to me, it's something that did cross my mind during this episode. I was wondering is, you know, there's a the whole bond is my word thing that Julia has set in place. I was wondering if it was going to be a circumstance of like the moment it was done once Raynard was dead, she wasn't going to actually give over the dagger or anything. She was actually going to kill 
Martin with it, that even though there might be ramifications for it, that, you know, and the grand scheme of things, taking care of him would be a good thing. So, you know, maybe she try and self-sacrifice herself like that. Like, even though she might suffer the ramifications for breaking her bond, maybe, I don't know. I mean, not because the whole point is to find loopholes and everything around it. So maybe she, you know, created one for herself in the beginning. Maybe it's not her who really has to keep up her side of the bond. I mean, really, more of it was focused on Martin keeping up his side of things, but maybe the same applies to her, too. But I was thinking maybe that was part of her plan. Maybe she never really thought that far ahead. Oh, because she, like, for her, she didn't think ahead. All she cared about was her revenge. And like I said, now she's left with nothing because even, like, Morena's dead. And you see her in front of Morena's body. And part of me, it don't even look like she's heartbroken. It looks more so than anything she's frustrated because the fact is now she missed her chance to kill Renard. I mean, don't get me wrong. Maybe there is a part of her that is sad about Morena. I mean, really, her and Morena weren't really tight anyway, but the fact is Morena still decided that she was going to help Julia anyway. I mean, really, it was kind of a self-preservation act because she knows, like, if she didn't help Julia take care of this situation, which Julia has the best chance, you know, with Martin on her side. Granted, she may not know who Martin is or who, being the beast, but she knows he could freeze a god, like, that he has the power. She does, so. I guess that kind of shows you just how good Morena was for it to even take that amount of time for Martin to kind of get through her war, which is why I was like, I don't know, and I did like, I don't know, I never really noticed that much, obviously there's kind of a, a science and mag, um, math to magic, and when you saw him kind of, it was almost like he was dissecting an equation when he was pulling up about a reward, I never really remember seeing too much of that in season one, maybe there was, and I just like, kind of overlooked it, but I was just seeing, it almost like, obviously you could see like equations all across, like, or at least symbols that look like equations when he was pulling her ward apart, but... Now Morena's dead, and it's it's kind of something I brought up in a different show. I don't remember something I was talking about earlier this week uh, that kind of remind me of this. But it's like, oh yeah, there's this one bad guy. It was Agents of Shield. That's what it was. That basically, oh you have this one bad guy. It's like, oh you thought they were going to be a persistent bad guy. And it's like, oh they're taking care of. It. It's like really? Because I thought Morena would have been like a consistent thing, but it's like, nope, she's dead. I still don't really know what the hell Reynard is up to. Um, I love what I love Ember in this episode kind of going trailing back because I'm pulling everything together in my head it's the whole um, situation with the wellspring he just beat around the bush he's like oh I just defiled it and everything and Martin's like wait you did you what he's like I took a poop in it like, he's shitting it he's like am I am, are you missing the point here it's like he, he does not it's so weird that he is a god because it seems like he's the very most does not seem very godlike and there was a conversation him and Martin was having that makes me wonder like is Ember as good? I think I kept getting her name flipped, switched in my head. Like, because I think I was thinking Umber was still alive, but Ember was dead, or whatever the case may be. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm still getting those confused now. But nevertheless, um, he tainted the wellspring, so there's no more get, getting uh, any power from that. Because even when Martin tries to go near it, it's just the stitch is just too much for him. Not the way I thought that was going to be handled. I was I was thinking, I was like, oh, when I found out that, because, you know, Margot and Elliot went to him, I was like, oh, obviously, like, oh, he must be there to drink from himself. It's like, that's why I was like, oh, is he going to step up as a bad guy himself? But it's like, no, it doesn't seem like that's the case. I even love the fact is that you had um, Quentin being like, yeah, that can't be good for Fillory. And then it turned into a battle between Alice and Martin and... Things keep getting heated, heated up, and she's getting she has the advantage in the fight. But the fact of the matter, even in his weakened state, Martin's still stronger than her because she's slowly losing powers, and to the point she completely loses it. And so she starts using the spell, and it starts turning her into a nifum. And same thing that happened to her brother Charlie. I I said nifum niffin, and. It's like oh man, it's like Quentin's telling her to stop, and she's like no, it's going to be okay, and she turns. And ends up, you know, and Martin's like, oh, she's gone. But then she comes over and just, she stops him. And it just shows you how powerful she is, that even as powerful as Martin he is. Because even in his weakened state, he's still pretty powerful. But even in that state, like, she outranks him completely. Because at one moment, she's behind him. And the next moment you turn, she's, like, right in front of him. And then he's like, she's like, oh, you want to say something? She taps his mouth and he's able to talk again. He's like, oh, we could work together. And she's basically like, no, nope, too late. Opens up his shirt. All the butterflies fall fly out of his body. I, uh, a very, in a twisted way, it's kind of a beautiful way she killed him. Now it's kind of interesting. Not the way I thought. I was like, oh, she's going to rip through his chest or something like that. It's like, no, she released all the butterflies. I guess that's supposed to represent, like, maybe that's her kind of sucking out every, it's the butterflies were uh, men or moths or whatever the case may be 
were a manifestation of his life. So all of the all you see them flying away, the more of it starts flying away, the more of his life force is disappearing. And he drops dead. Kind of the same thing with Marina. Wasn't expect, especially because he got away and everything. I thought this is going to be a situation where it's going to be a draw and he was going to get away again until he kind of built his strength back up. It's like, nope, the beast is dead. At least for now, you don't know how things could turn back around. But then you have Alice there, a Niffin, and she's about to attack everyone. So Q uses his Keiko demon to attack her. But then you see her lying there on the floor, dead, and just like Elliot and Margot there trying to comfort Quentin. As he's just like, sees a woman he loves there dead. And it's like, wait, is this the end? And because the fact of the matter, she only came back last time because she still had, you know, got, you know, God power in her. And now that was completely gone. So there's no coming back. Maybe, especially if she is like, I wonder when he attacked her, did he completely disrupt the Niffin and just like all that's left? It's because the whole point of being a Niffin is like your body burns up and all that's left of you is the magic. Obviously, Charlie kind of got sealed away. So I was thinking maybe he was going to end up having to do the same thing to her. But it turns out, I mean, we see her body there. So it's like, is she knocked down unconscious? Did she, is she completely dead? It's like, did he kind of disperse the magic that was left of Alice? And then all that's left is her body, which sucks. Like, Because obviously you knew something was going to happen because that whole conversation that almost like, yeah, we could both die type of conversation. She, he's basically like, okay, so think positively. Like, what would you want to do after this? She's like, get a Sunday. And he's like, hey, I want to get back together and kind of win you back. She's like, I'm not a prize. He's like, I know. I'm not trying to say it like that. You understand what I mean that, you know, you're a different person. Then you are great and amazing when you when I first met you. But you're even more amazing now because you've grown. And I've kind of done the same thing, too. I've grown into a person that's kind of realized that the fact of the matter is to, you know, give me a chance to kind of prove myself to you, to prove that I can be worthy of you. And they kiss and everything, and it's just, because it's like, dude, like she's already stressed out because like this is a moment they're going up against him with very little time on their hands, and it's like, oh, they could die, and it's like, it's like a lot to kind of have on your shoulder. It's like all it comes down to you stopping the beast here and now, and then it just it sucks that things played out that way, and it's just like you know after you know the whole point was kind of make plans so that you could come through this alive, but it's like Alice is gone. And just that uh, just fucking heartbreaking that things had to play out this way. I was like hoping something was going to happen. It's like, oh, Quentin's going to summon some incredible magic and help out in the end to stop Alice from doing that. But it's like she went through it. I was like, dude, that sucks. And like, oh, she's going for it. And I was kind of but then I was like hoping somehow they'd be able to pull her back. But the moment you go turn into a Niffin, there might not. I mean, it doesn't seem like there is a way to go back. But not lest they do what she was going to try to do with Charlie to bring him back. What if Quentin tries to do that now to bring Alice back? So I mean, then you had like going back to the Julia situation because she because she basically screwed over Quint, um Penny because Penny wouldn't help her. It's like you screwed over their plan. Like it's a circumstance. Like I said, her need for revenge. Like, even though you can understand it, it is a situation where the greater evil was the beast, possibly because the fact is that he represents a danger to everyone and everything which isn't to say Reynard isn't one either but it's kind of a circumstance of like he's kind of needs to be dealt with now because he's drinking from the well and basically once Fillory's magic is gone all magic is gone which you know you would think Julia would kind of understand is like that means going after Reynard will be pretty hard if the, but at the same time like I said maybe Julia had a backup plan with the whole like uh, knife situation where she was going to backstab him I mean you kind of get my wording on that but I don't know it just it literally feels like no one really wanted this episode. It looks like everyone freaking lost, you know? And it does make you wonder where Julia and Q are going to stand now, like, after everything. Well, not just even him, just everyone in the group, how they... I mean, especially because she kind of screwed over Penny and took off his other... Both his things, one by accident, and the other's on purpose. And now his hands are acting crazy, and basically he was traveling all over the place, like, in that particular area, bouncing all around, hitting, like, ramming into a bench and stuff like that, so... There's that. I was thinking that since he was back in Fillory and he had his hands kind of under control, I thought he was going to meet up with the dude who did that to his hands and kind of mess him up or something or have some kind of conversation with him. But that didn't happen, at least not yet. But like uh, kind of where everyone stands because Julia didn't get her revenge and the whole situation with the beast played out the way it did. You know, Quentin might blame Julia because it's like if she hadn't been there, she just let them do what they needed to do. Then Alice would still be alive, but then Julio could say the same thing. It's like if it weren't for you, Moreno would be still be alive. And the fact of the matter is, um, Reynard would be dead. So it's just 
it seems like I said, it seems like they're at odds, they're good, they're at odds, they're good for a moment, and then they're at odds again. So I'm very curious to see out of anything where they stand at the end of all of this. Like, what's next? Obviously, I've, there's one thing in particular I've seen from some of the previews. I've tried to avoid them as much as possible. There's one particular thing that I've seen. It's even popped up in some of like the posters and stuff. Like it's kind of like kind of a thumbnail that you'll see a lot of times a picture representing this season. There's like a creature, and I'm wondering what the hell that's about. Is that Conan supposed to be like the next antagonist? Like where everything stands, like what's next for them? Because that was the whole conversation with Q. Like, what is next? You know, so I'm very interested to find out. And now moving on to this week's episode of The 100. So basically, the team, the few people and Arcadia that include the mains being Bellamy, Raven, Clark, and Monty come up with the decision of like how they're going to deal with this whole... Because you still have Raven being like, we should tell everyone, but Bellamy's like, that's not a good idea. And Clark agrees. It's like, telling everyone is not a good idea because obviously, brought up last episode, the fact of the matter is a lot of people will be out for themselves. Like, it's just going to be like a... You know, it's like only be concerned about them or their own people surviving. And at the same time, Raven's like, well, we need to at least tell people in Arcadia because at least that way we'd have some people to actually volunteer and help. Because a big thing is the fact is no one is going like obviously she gets some people later on in the episode, but it's only like five people. And even then it's like, well, that's not enough to fix up, you know, the arc because that ends up being their plan. Like, oh, like the arc survived like 97 years in you know, roughly 100 years in space, surviving temperature changes and radiation. It's like if they can build it up, it can act as the shelter to kind of let, kind of lead them throughout the radiation. So I guess, you know, survive long enough for the radiation to eventually die back down, you know, given enough time, or maybe kind of even get to a certain degree where if they spend enough time around the radiation, at least locked within the arc, that eventually maybe their bodies will kind of get accustomed to it. I guess, um, I don't know, like, but the fact, the point I was getting to is the fact is that because no one knows of the dangers that are coming, no one's in a hurry to like, hey, let's work together. For Clark, it makes sense not to tell them anything because it's like, why worry people about a certain thing that's going to happen? Yes, it's going to happen, but at least let them kind of have their peace of mind now and only concern them when there's a solution, you know. But just sadly, things don't work that way because Bellamy goes with uh, Nate, Brian, Harper, and Monty, and they all go to basically an Ice Nation area to track, get a special device that they're going to need to make uh, inside the ship habitable for like all 500 people. I mean, granted, it's just the start because they need to worry about saving the people in Arcadia, but it's also about making sure everyone else, that includes the grounders and everyone that's part of the um, coalition to survive together. Like, it's not just about Arcadia and just the Sky Crew. But when they get there, things aren't that good because obviously Brian at first has the biggest problem because he's like these people here that inhabit in, that are inhabiting uh, this particular station uh, that's the one he was from that a lot of people he knew or killed that includes children as well um, because he's one of those people he helped out last season with the whole Pike situation and yes Octavia killed him which he kind of feels bad about because like no matter how much of a dick Pike was and how much of a dictator he was the fact is Pike helped him survive for like three months and stuff like that so it's like you know he was still their chancellor and so it's kind of like you know stabbing the leader of their group in a bag and he did it because he was only doing it for Nathan's sake so I mean, this episode kind of put a bit strain on their relationship because it comes down to it's like because they end up finding out there's a whole bunch of other people inside. There are at least a group of 25 people that are kind of acting as slaves in labor who are going to be eventually moved. And now it's like, OK, so what do we do? This device we're getting, this coolant device could be used as a bomb or we could take it back to Arcadia like we came here to do. And basically it's a it's a halfway split. Everyone's like split on one side. One side is like, oh, we need to take it back. Basically, the numbers is that, like, yeah, you feel bad for these people. This is 25 people out of the 500 people that could be sit. This device can help save in Arcadia. You know, it's a numbers thing. But at the same time, it's like, no, these people are here now. And if we don't do this now, we won't get another chance to, like, come back later. Even going to talk to Rowan, it won't mean anything because these people will be gone by then. And it came down to Bellamy to make the final decision. And he decided to help the people out. Turns out that particular guy that was kind of leading that group is actually the one that killed um, Monty's dad. Monty himself didn't kill him. He just freed everyone else, and they those people gathered together and ended up killing him. 
So kind of coinciding with that, uh, it's kind of the whole Jasper's whole situation. It's the fact is, it like, Jasper's situation is sad yet also infuriating. Because the fact of the matter is, all this stems from Maya. From her dying and everything last season. Well, not last season. At the end of season two and everything. Like, she was the person he loved and cared about the most. And it's something that last season people kept trying to beat into his head. He's not the only one that's in pain. Everyone lost someone last season. Clark lost Lexa. Uh, Bellamy lost a woman he was in love with. It's just like a lot of people lost a lot of... Even Raven, she lost uh, She lost Finn in the past. Plus, she also lost Sinclair, who was like a mentor to her. It's just like, you know, you have Octavia losing Lincoln. It's like there was loss all around. And it's it's sad, it's sad but also frustrating. It's like, dude, you... You parade around here because he's super happy about this whole life. He's, he's like, uh, go ahead and try and waste your time to save us. It's not going to help. The fact of the matter is, we're all doomed. It's fine. I don't want to be saved. I don't want to try and save us. It's like, dude, who, you know, he's kind of lazy fair about the whole situation. Even going as far as kind of berating Clark a little bit. It's like, oh, you're not going to tell everyone the truth? It's like, well, you should. You know, what about the whole, like, fighting... Um, Alley to get back our free will and everything. Shouldn't you tell everyone to kind of have their own free decision to decide what they dis- decide to do with the rest of their lives? And he's like, oh, the reason why you won't tell them is because you're afraid of how they might react and stuff like that, which is, like I said, it's just, it's so infuriating because it's like you have such a strong death wish that you're, you're just kind of taunting her and everything. Because the sad thing is, Clark is in a very hard predicament. She's in a very hard place because, I mean, it's even something that obviously Thelonious can tell from the way she was looking. Obviously, he's not on the in- on the know about all this. But, um, because initially he wants to help. Obviously, Raven's, like, super pissed about that. Like, why would I let you help and everything? It's like, you're the reason why this all happened. You don't want to brought Allie into this. But to be fair, Clark kind of defends him. It's like, he was chipped, too. Yes, he was looking for the City of Light, but that's because he wanted, you know, to find something. I mean, he needed to find something. He lost his son. And he's just trying to do what's best for his people. Yes, you could argue maybe it was also him trying to reclaim some sort of power. But at the same time, it's just like he wanted to go find a way. A way for it for him and his people. Yes, it backfired on him. But everything he did was because of Ali. So you can't really blame him to be 100% the start of all this. Yes, he started out, salad it out. But it's not like... You can't, I don't know, like, I don't 100% fault Thelonious for a lot of that stuff because all that was under the control of Allie, so he was a man that was in a vulnerable state that the AI was telling him, it's like, no, I can give, just like anyone else, it's not like Thelonious got to, it's like, you know, because even Raven's got to admit the fact is that she gave in too because it's the thought of, like, getting rid of her pain and everything, I mean, granted, was kind of, you know, she was forced to do some things, obviously slit her own wrists and stuff like that, but that wasn't necessarily Thelonious, that was kind of, you know, Allie kind of getting inside of Thelonious head as a means of trying to get inside of Raven's head. It's like, oh, how, he knows how to break a person. So it was like, obviously, she'd go to him. So, you know, it's a give and take type of situation. But he's willing to help, and he deserves kind of another chance. Because he's like, all the mistakes he's made, he has to live with that. So he's got to try and make up for it. But the point is, he knows exactly the position Clark in, is in before he knows the entire situation. Because he knows what it means, in his words, to hold the crown. Because there's a whole arc situation that eventually the arc, you know, wasn't going to have enough life support for everyone. That circumstance, he kept that truth, killed a lot of people who knew that truth just so it wouldn't, you know, leak out and cause a panic. It's like you do things because you think it's the right thing. He says, you know, with the information you have at the time. And that's like what Clark's doing right now. She hasn't told anyone else, the main public, about what's going on. Obviously, very few grounders actually know the truth and very few Sky Crew know the truth. But it's kind of a situation where it's like it's a tough predicament to be in. I mean, because it kind of trailing back to the whole Bellamy situation, too. It's like. He made a choice, too, and then Raven kind of gets on him and is like, oh, you made a very selfish choice. It's like, obviously, Bellamy's doing this because he's trying to do some good, you know, make up for what he did in the past. But it's a situation like, do we leave those people behind to die? You know, it's like, you know, even sacrificing one person for this whole circumstance, does it, you know, is that okay? I mean, just sacrificing even one person if it means the rest of everyone else surviving. So would those 25 people being sacrificed be okay? Even a child... You know, but, you know, at the same time, you could argue playing devil's advocate is like it. 
will it would cost like all the I say, like, oh yeah, they're free and everything, but for how long? Because eventually they'll die in another six months. Like I said, it's a, it's a hard decision for anyone to be, especially in Clark and Bellamy's case, but definitely in Clark's case because she has to be the one to hold the secret. Obviously, Raven's like, oh, you we run through the plan of telling everyone the truth, which Clark does to a certain degree. Obviously, she doesn't say anything, everything, because of the fact that it's kind of talking to Delonius and you know his understanding. Like she finally kind of understands why he did what he did. You know, locking her up, you know, obviously pushing everything to be like, what's up with the 100? Because only a few people knew what the 100 were really meant to do on Earth and stuff like that, what their purpose was. And obviously, you know, that's why her dad was floated was because he found out the truth and everything, too. So but Clark says, like, OK, the fact is we're going to survive this together, like saying, like, oh, by working together, we'll survive this. But that's not 100 percent the truth, because without that cooling system, the art could only sustain maybe 100 people There are like 500 people here. So she's fudging the truth. She's not telling the entire truth. She's telling parts of it, but enough to get people motivated, which Raven's super pissed about is like, well, good speech and everything. She's like, well, sometimes people need hope more than they need the truth. It's like, oh, your father would be proud of you even because. Her dad sacrificed himself just because he was so adamant about the truth coming out that he even was willing to, he knew what it would cost him, but he still wanted the truth to come out. And like, once again, I couldn't even imagine being in Clark's position because the fact of the matter is, you know, it came down to it because, you know, Raven was like, oh, she's not the head engineer and Clark's like, I'm not the chancellor, but we find ourselves in this position. And it's like, she's in this position. She's the one that has to take responsibility because she played like she... You know, because she was the one that ultimately made the decision is like, you know, can you like, I mean, really what it comes down to is like, was doing what she did the right decision, like to give people free will. I mean, and it's like, yeah, but at the same time, it's like, even though Allie was kind of ca capturing people's minds and everything, she did have a good reason for doing it, you know, but Clark still kind of shut down the city of light. So it's hard to say what's where everything stands especially like like i said i went back i'm going back to what i brought up earlier the whole nate and brian situation even they kind of haven't fallen out because it, he's like nate tell me at the very least you think me us uh, saving those people are the right move and he's like no i don't think it was just as soon as now there's a difference of opinion there it's like for one it's just like the whole chancellor situation because pike like i said saved his life and everything kept him alive in all this time and it's like yeah he, pike might have been an asshole sometimes but it, like he followed pike and believed in pike's message just because you know, he felt like he owed Pike that much. And it's like, that guy was our elected chancellor. And it's like, you know, we betrayed him and ended up, you know, Octavia killed him and everything. Which I'm guessing, is that a known secret that Octavia... I don't think he was... Was he there? To see Octavia do that? Most people don't know that Octavia is the one that killed Pike. So for him to know that, I don't know. I can't remember if he was... I think he might have been there. I don't know. I don't know. It just... It just Sucks all around. I mean, like I said, the main point is like try to save as many people as you can for now. I mean, to me, this can only go one way. It can go very badly because I feel like, you know, because like I said, a main threat is Jasper. Jasper's going to do whatever he can to jeopardize this. He will screw things up, probably tell, find out some stuff. Like, obviously, he knows more of the truth than anyone else. Obviously, he's probably, I'm sure in the going forward, they're going to keep him out of the dark because it's like, even he's going to like try and jeopardize this because he's so content with dying. Even when the whole speech that they're going to, he's kind of like, kind of had a sour look on his face because he doesn't want, you know, he doesn't want things to go uh, for it because the fact of the matter is uh, but I think at the same time it's because he also knew Clark wasn't telling the entire truth so I don't know it's just I get the feeling more so than anything he's going to go for and it makes you wonder because you kind of, like I really want to know what's on his mind and also what's on Thelonious like I wrote I threw it out there I kind of think that's what's on Jasper's mind but maybe that's not all there is to it I'm mean, like I said his character is very complex like I said it's sad yet at the same time infuriating but I'm very curious to know what Thelonious thinks does he agree with her decision do he goes like well the fact of the matter is she made that decision it's not really a right or wrong it's just a matter of she said what she needed to at the time like, that's what really comes down to. Now, the other side of the episode deals with, I think his name is Ilian. Essentially, he's a boy that kind of dealt with the chip situation, basically killed his mom, his dad, and his brother, and basically wants to avenge him. He comes to an ambassador. This ambassador wants to challenge Rowan because it's like Rowan's protecting the Sky Crew. The whole City of Light situation was their fault, which Ilian agrees, but he's like, we shouldn't punish Rowan for that. That was 100% the Sky Crew, but it's like, no, he protects Sky Crew. It's basically his blade to follow on. 
But Rowan isn't in position to be challenged, you know, which Kane was like, don't do this. Obviously, you know, we got skin in this fight because we need you to stay alive. Because if you go down in a duel, basically everything gets screwed over for us because Sky Crew is no longer looked after. They will come after us and then basically all of us burn anyway. But for Rowan, he, he needs to do this because he knows if he sends someone else to out the fight, none of the people will respect him, none of the ambassador or anyone that has doubts about him being king. No one will follow him if he sends some other warrior out, which he has the right to. Even Echo going as far as being like, oh, you have the power to set the rules, but it's like he doesn't want to rule like that. It's a situation where it's like if he himself cannot fight, then he doesn't deserve to be like he deserve. He has to fight to keep his crown. And it's also because his mom ruled by fear, you know, uh, probably amassing a powerful army and just sending out strong fighters to do her bidding for her, her own planning and machinations and stuff led to her downfall and everything. Like rather than coinciding with Lex's plan, it ended up being her undoing and everything. So he's being a little more open to the idea of kind of ruling the way Lexa did, kind of inter bringing in Sky Crew and everything, obviously because he knows the truth and everything, which he tells Echo, which Echo then is like, oh, how can you be so foolish, my king? And he's like, well, you helped me win this battle. You go to um, Arcadia and kind of check out to see if my trust in Juanita Clark is warranted or not, which... Might be kind of proving to be a different thing. I don't probably a thing all on its own. Um, I don't know exactly how do you really prove that necessarily that the world is going to end in like six months. But Rowan kind of believes it. Like I said, because she passed on a flame and everything. But still, he has his reservations, especially because Echo, you know, because Echo's like, oh, Sky Crew will say anything to save their lives, especially because of the whole like the reason why the ambassador thing turned out the way it did. I just, to me, as every season goes for it's like Octavia was not the way she is now. And it's like everyone's changed. Everyone's had to make some drastic changes to who they were, their own beliefs and where their own stances were because of just everything that's happened. And you look at Octavia. Octavia is nowhere near the same girl that she was. Hell, not even Clark. Not even Bellamy. You know, Bellamy, like I said, from the very beginning, started off a very selfish dude back in season one. Even the whole reason why... He was there in the first place was for very selfish reasons. But nevertheless, like, you see him now. I mean, even after all the ups and downs he's had, like, he's still not the same person. None of them are after their experiences over all this time across the series. But as especially Octavia, like, without hesitation, she killed that ambassador. So that spike in his hand just, just, like, wiped it away like it was nothing, like... She's become very cold-hearted, and it kind of makes sense. I, I kind of brought up the Lincoln situation. It's like, oh, um, subsequently, since Lincoln died, her heart's grown even colder. I mean, it, maybe things between her and Bellamy are okay. Obviously, they were very rocky uh, last season, but it seemed like they got to a place where they're caught. I mean, we don't really see them interacting too much, so it's still obviously not to what it was because of Lincoln dying and all the grounders that got killed because of, you know, Pike and whatnot, so... And then, like, after she killed him and everything, she touched um, Ilian's shoulder, and it's like, oh, yeah. He's like, so are you going to kill me next? And she's like, I'm sorry for your family, and just walks away. So whether that becomes something going forward with Ilian himself, with his decision, obviously he has this problem with Sky Crew, but his main reason for being able to go forward was because he had an ambassador's backing, and the ambassador was, quote-unquote, looking out for him. But at the same time, Octavia's like, you know the ambassador wouldn't give a crap about you. The only reason why he's challenging Rowan is because Rowan is weak now, and he feels like he would have the chance to take him down it's like he can run his mouth all he wants but he only decided to challenge Roman now after he got hurt so and it looks like Kane has it figured out that like oh she had to have some part to play in it but it also seems like Echo might have figured it out too like I said what that means I don't know I don't know if Rowan had kind of figured it out too because it looked like he was kind of looking towards Kane to see if like kind of read Kane or not so it's overall just a lot of circumstances, a lot of stuff going down, and it's just going to be where everything's going to end up going forward. I just, I really hope at the end of the day, like, none of this blows up in Clark's face, which it ultimately will. That's the problem with secrets. They will always have a way to, to kind of come out. I mean, granted, we still don't know. I mean, especially doing what they did, killing all those ice nationers but it seems like they were kind of on their own it's not like they really respected rowan anyway so it's not like they were really listening but i feel like that still will come back to them but maybe it'll be a situation where it's like sky crew can add um feign ignorance to it that basically it's like oh some other people i don't know 
I feel like there would obviously be ramifications for that, but maybe not. Maybe they're kind of outside of the whole coalition thing. Because obviously they didn't respect Rowan as king, so maybe they're not really tight with that. Maybe they're kind of a subgroup of the Ice Nation that's just kind of off on their own. I don't know. Definitely going to be very interesting seeing things go forward from here. But really, that's all I want to talk about in this episode. To the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.